a lot of passages in Ajahn Mahabhu's teachings where he talks about learning how to see the distinction between yourself and a pain, say it's in the body. And he identifies yourself with the mind for that purpose. And there are people who will jump on that and accuse him of saying, oh yes, and there is a self. They miss the point that he's speaking strategically. You have to have a clear sense of self and the boundaries of yourself if you're going to see anything at all in the practice, because you have to learn how to divide yourself or separate yourself out of things that you claimed as yourself or just assumed were yourself. And you have to do that in stages. You can't just drop self altogether. And John Lee makes a similar point about people who write the drop of a hat just go straight to the teachings on inconstancy, stress, and not self, and don't take care of themselves. There are two reasons why you want to have a strategic sense of self. One is that your body and mind are things you're going to have to use, and you have to look after them. You have to care for them. And so when you're working with the breath, say you have a strong sense that you are inhabiting your body. And this is your space, because you get to use the breath as medicine for what may come up in the body, times when you're hungry, times when you're tired, times when you're feeling flustered about things around you. And in order to let go, you also need a good, solid place to stand. And this is what the sense of inhabiting the body provides you with. In fact, ideally, as you're getting into concentration, you want to have a sense that the body and the mind and the breath are all one. The breath fills the body, the mind fills the body, the mind is one with the breath. They're all sitting here together. And then you can use this sense of you inhabiting your space when you're dealing with other people. It helps you see when your mind goes out to catch their words or to allow their words to come in. When someone's speaking to you and the energy is strong, you would have a strong sense that they can't penetrate your space. The words can go around. You know what they're saying. You can, In fact, when you're not so concerned with your reaction to what they're saying, you can hear more clearly what's behind the words and deal with the situation a lot more effectively. But to do that, you have to have a strong sense that you are here in your space, filling your space with good energy. So you're both strengthening your, your tools of the things you're going to use for the practice and providing yourself with a good, strong place to stay, to take your stance. And you're, you've got a clear dividing line. Any thoughts that go out to pick up what that person is saying, or to take it into you, your inside space, you see that they're violating that line. So you want to keep that line clear. And as you're sitting here meditating, you're not dealing with other energies outside, but you want to have a good, strong sense that you can stay here and fill this space consistently. It's such a strange quality of this kind of concentration that as you get everything together here like this, then when the time comes for them to divide out into separate things, they divide along their natural fault lines. We may have some preconceived notions about which part is the mind, which part is the body. Or if there's a pain, which part is the pain. But all too often we cut things across the wrong lines. It's only when they're allowed to stay together like this that then, with the effort of the practice of continual alertness and your ardency, they begin to separate out on their own. This is when you start using a John Mahabhu's approach of thinking of your mind as you, the body as something else, 
the pain is something else. Here they are, they're all sitting together in the same space, but how are they different? They're different in quality. It's like radio waves in the air. There are the stations from Tijuana, stations from San Diego, stations from Los Angeles, all going through the air, all going through your body right now on different frequencies. And if you had a radio here, all you do is turn the dial a little bit and you can pick up the different stations and separate them out from the others so you can hear each one clearly. Well, it's the same with the pain, same with the body, same with the mind. They're here in the same space, but they're different qualities. The mind is the knowing quality. The body doesn't know anything. It's just earth, water, wind, fire. The pain is something else. It's not earth, it's not water, it's not wind, it's not fire. It's a feeling tone. And when you don't glom it together with the body, you begin to see that feeling tone moves around a lot. In particular, it moves around in connection with your perception, the labels you're putting on things. The label that says pain, the label that says the pain is here. And you begin to realize there are certain acts of the mind that bridge that gap between your knowing element and the physical element. The act that says the pain is right there, your awareness is centered right here. You might ask yourself, is your awareness above the pain or is it below the pain? One way to catch yourself to understand what perceptions you have is to start asking questions like this. Because all too often we've we're so used to particular ways of perceiving things that they become unquestioned. We think that that's just the way they are. But if you ask a few off-the-wall questions, you begin to realize that you have a certain number of assumptions, which is another way that the Ajans translate sanya, or perception. There's a kamsamkan, which is an assumption. You have certain assumptions about where you are in relationship to the pain, or how solid the pain is, or where the pain is. And if you can catch those assumptions, those perceptions in the act, you see that they are actions and you can drop them. And then you have a very strong sense of the pain is one thing and your awareness is something else, the body is something else again. And then on a deeper stage, you start applying the same thing to other metal acts, the metal acts that identify what this mind is. So when you can separate those out, that's when really interesting, thing hap interesting things happen inside the mind. So your sense of self gets shrunken in, shrunken in. You divide the line between self and not self in different places until you've got it cornered. At that point you realize that the tools you've been using to do this are the things that you've been identifying with, the discernment, the concentration. When you see those as something separate, that's when you let go and things get really interesting. To notice in each case, it's drawing a line, seeing something that you glom together really as two separate things, and moving in, moving in, moving in. The Buddha has a passage where he says if you really want to let go, you have to see things as something separate. Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. See your ideas as something separate from your awareness. See your consciousness of your consciousness as something separate something you want to let go, an activity that you want to stop doing. And so when you're working on the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self, you learn how to apply them strategically. You don't just drop everything all at once. And in John Lee's terms, that means letting go like a pauper. You let go and you have nothing. To let go like a rich person, you take care of what you've got. 
the things that are really valuable and let go of the things that are not valuable. As for the things that are valuable, you find that some of them lose their value after a while. You let go of them, bit by bit by bit, until the work is all done. Then you can let go of everything. But in the meantime, you want to take care of what you've got, what your tools are. A couple of years back, I was talking with someone who'd been studying with an Ajahn who was critical of Ajahn Lee's technique of dealing with the breath. And he said, why work with the breath? Why try to fix the breath? It's just a sankara. It's something you should let go. I told her to tell him, well, why are you bathing your body? It's just a sankara. Of course, you bathe the body because you need to use it. You need to deal with people. And you don't want to offend yourself. So you take good care of it. It's the same with the breath. There will come a point where you let go of the breath, but in the meantime, take good care of it. Use it to fill the body with good energy. So when you're dealing with difficult people, you've got your own energy shield here to protect yourself. Take care of your perceptions and perceptions to keep you with the breath, because as you get more sensitive to the process of how your labels affect things. You can use that discernment to cut through all kinds of problems. So when you let go, let go strategically. When you hang on, hang on strategically. You know a John Cha's image. You've bought a banana, you're taking it back from the market. And someone asks you, what are you going to do with the banana? You say, I'm going to eat it. And they ask, are you going to eat the banana peel too? Well, no. Then why are you carrying the banana peel too? He says, how are you going to answer them? You answer through desire. You want to have a good answer. That's how you come up with the answer. He's illustrating the fact that desire itself has a, has a role to play in the practice. So don't go around just saying, I have no preferences, I have no desires. That doesn't get you anywhere at all. You're taking the banana peel because if you don't have the banana peel, the banana turns to mush in your hand. When the time comes to eat, you take the peel off, throw it away then. Hang on to things you need to hang on to. Take good care of them. Let go of them only when they have no more purpose when they serve no more purpose. This way you learn to think strategically, and that's how you're going to use the Buddhist teachings properly, as strategies. And then when they've done their work, you can let everything go. 